Hi, I'm Brian Anderson, and you're here on Head On, and my guest tonight is Dean Godry. And uh, Dean, I guess uh, a couple questions, some, uh, a little bit of background. You're the chair of Nanaimo and Area Land Trust. That's right. I've been uh, involved with the Nanaimo Area Land Trust, or NALT, uh, since the beginning, back in the uh, mid-90s when we founded it. And I've been actually the co-chair pretty well since the beginning as well. So what does Nanaimo Area Land Trust sort of do in a nutshell? Well, our, our mission statement is to, uh, to protect green space in the, in the Nanaimo area. That's in a nutshell what we're all about. And okay. it, uh, it's something that, that we recognized the need for back in the, in the early 90s uh, with a lot of uh, development going on. And a lot of pressure on properties. Uh, one of the things that was really key was the neck point uh, controversy that was going on at that time. We felt that it would be really important to be proactive and be out ahead of that kind of crisis type of uh, situation and just start to plan for, for that in advance. So and I think the reason we wanted to get together tonight was uh, to talk about an old logger and his legacy. Yeah. So, um, and I, if for those that don't know, I'm talking about Merv Wilkinson. Yes. And uh, he had a parcel of land out in Cedar. Yeah, I think it's, it, it's in and around 78 acres of, uh, of old growth forest that was a uh, remnant old growth forest in Cedar uh, that he purchased in the, in the late 30s and began managing in the um, mid 40s and did a, numerous cuts over the years. Um, the real hallmark of what he was about was sustainably harvesting in a way that meant that after he'd done his 11th cut, there was more volume of timber on the land than when he first purchased it, purchased the land. So um, he was really uh, modeling a, a kind of forestry that uh, has been established for quite some time in Europe and um, in the range of 300 years that's been in uh, use in Europe. Uh, Merv really, I think, wanted to spread almost like uh, a, a, another school of thought on forestry. As what, opposed to the clear cutting. Yeah, he, he felt that uh, a more, uh, I guess, sustainable individual tree selection approach was, was much more uh, of a natural kind of process and... and okay. Yeah. Now, one of the things that I understood was that Merv had sold his property or deeded his property to the Land Conservancy. Yeah, um, TLC or the Land Conservancy of British Columbia purchased Merv's land at uh, near the end of Merv's life. I think in the last ten years of his life or, or thereabouts, when he wasn't really able to to do the forestry work anymore. Although I did see him falling large trees up till he was 88. Um, pretty amazing, really. Um, but uh, he, after a little while after that, he sold his land at a, at a markedly reduced price to TLC with the idea that they would uh, manage it and sustain his, his uh, sort of school of forestry ideals and, and use it as a teaching forest. Now, I guess one of the things, and that's what sort of intrigued me, is I'd heard recently that there were some difficulties with uh, TLC, and wasn't the property uh, offered for sale? And well, yes, that's very true. TLC, uh, I think in its over-enthusiasm to, to do land protection, purchased too many properties and got themselves into a a seven million dollar debt position that they weren't able to to sustain and so they went into receivership and are still in that uh, process now although they're starting to see some light at the end of the tunnel and one of the pieces that they're working through based on what the court is is ordering is that they sell some of their properties to uh, ensure that that the creditors get repayment so how does that sit with somebody that basically 
sells their land at a discounted value <clears throat> with the intent that it be maintained for a certain purpose or use? Well, I can say that the, the problems of TLC have, have really had a ripple effect throughout the land trust movement in British Columbia, and we've all really felt the, the, uh, the pain that they have gone through. We're not directly connected, although we do work in partnership. I think that, that um, some of the people that are, are seeing land sold are very, very upset about it. Um, and, and understandably so, but I think that if TLC can come through this process, they will be there for the long term. Um, that's their, their goal, and, and I hope they're successful at, at doing that. But I guess it gets back to the question that here, this fellow's handed over his property, and he has really no say. How does... How can you protect yourself if you've got something that you specifically want to maintain over time and have it, not have it developed or clear-cut? Well, one of the things that we were looking to see done right after the property was transferred to TLC was that we were at Nault, we were prepared to co-hold Covenant on, on Wildwood so that, uh, so that Merv's wishes would be... Um, protected on title. Uh, covenants under Section uh, 219 are a very, very strong legal um, tool for land trusts to help landowners ensure that their goals are what prevail over the long, long term. And, and so the covenant is attached to title and travels through time with the land on, on title. So um, that's what we thought should have happened at the time. And we, on a regular basis, approach TLC to see if they were ready to, to put Covenant on, on Wildwood. Um, we were continually disappointed to find out that they weren't prepared to do that. Um, so but it wasn't done initially? It, it wasn't done initially. Oh, okay. uh, no. And, and that's unfortunate because I think that Merv's wishes in many ways weren't, in a lot of ways, being... Uh, realized through the, the time that it's been with TLC. Uh, there were no other cuts after Merv's uh, handed the land over to TLC. Certainly not that I'm aware of or heard about. And one of the things that Merv talked really frequently about was the need for the, the land to continue to be a teaching opportunity in terms of this sort of second school of thought on forestry. So, now I understand that this isn't, while there is a sale, it's not necessarily going to get sold and clear cut. Is that my understanding? Absolutely not. Um, there's no chance of that happening. What um, the TLC has been in discussions with two groups over the last two years that have had an interest in purchasing Wildwood. One of them is the organization that managed Wildwood after Merv handed it over to, to um, TLC, the Ecoforest Institute. Um, they have expressed an interest and put forward a, a, a proposal to purchase, as did Mark Randon uh, in partnership with Merv's daughter, Tisha Wilkinson. Um, they have been working with TLC to, to come up with a, a a sale that will allow TLC to to pay off its creditors, but also what what Nault feels very strongly needs to happen is at the time of transfer that Covenant goes on the land at that time. That's in in many ways the best time for uh, Covenant to go on at the time of the sale in in sort of concert with that. And I guess in retrospect, it probably should have gone on when Merv transferred it. Absolutely. Transferred it. It, it you know, and, and that would have um, really provided the the framework for Merv's wishes to be to be uh, acted on. And you know, in in this instance, this is going to be quite different than many other covenants that we we have, and that most of the covenants that we have say that okay, you you cannot do these things. Um, and there'll be some of that kind of language within this covenant, but it will also have language that says 
that you will do these things. And in other words, it will stipulate the kind of forestry activities that should and will take place on a, uh, a fairly prescriptive approach that would mirror exactly MERV's uh, methods and, and wishes. So my understanding, only because I was talking to you earlier and you mentioned it, uh, but NALT actually has some property that it holds stewardship over. That's correct, and it's, it's interesting we have two properties that we have been um, bequeathed and, and we're very, very cautious about accepting land because very often it comes with costs that, that can be yeah. problematic and we, we're very, very fiscally conservative I think is, is a good way to describe Nault's approach to managing uh, land and managing our affairs. But, um, so we have accepted two properties and interestingly neither of them we've been able to put covenant on because they both happen to be within the agricultural land reserve and the uh, agricultural land commission has uh, declined our, our efforts to, to put covenant on, on the Van Kirkley's property and, and as a result of that we, we haven't moved forward with covenant on the other property which is uh, in the agricultural land reserve as well. So. So the use of these property, they're both farms, I take it? Um, they, they both were uh, farm properties. They're not actively farmed anymore. Uh, and they, um, so we have um, a voluntary stewardship agreement with the previous owners. And that, uh, in the case of the Van Kirkleys, uh, they have a life estate on that they continue to enjoy their, the property until they, they can't stay there anymore. So I take it if I was uh, wanting to deed you my mortgage, that wouldn't fly because you mentioned uh, no, cash flow. No, we, we uh, do a pretty careful analysis of the, the property and its, its uh, potential liabilities and, and issues that, that could make it unsustainable financially for Nault to, to take a property. So as a policy matter, we actually prefer not to take land um, on. We prefer to pass it on to agencies like the re regional district of uh, Nanaimo and the city of Nanaimo in the case of uh, Lindley Valley. That's what we, we did when we were involved in the negotiations for Lindley Valley is we, we worked in concert with the city to finalize a purchase and, and just handed our interest over to the city of Nanaimo and the same on Mount Benson. Okay, so it's a bit different when you're talking parkland or um, undeveloped land that doesn't have a cash flow, but in the case of Wildwood, sustainable or by taking out some of the trees and lo logging it and selling off the, the timber, it does produce a cash flow. It, it, it should. Um, you know, Merv always said that he derived uh, one third of his income from it and that if he could have milled the wood himself, he could have derived a full income from his 70 odd acres of, uh, of sustainable forest. So um, yeah, it, it looks as if the, or, uh, the group that's been accepted by TLC, although I, I haven't heard the final uh, on this, but it, it, it looks as if the um, fellow that worked with Murr for probably the last 15 years that he managed Wildwood, um, <clears throat> Mark Randon will, will be able to do that same kind of forestry that Merv did and part of the proceeds would go to paying off what he owes to Wildwood or to TLC I would imagine. Um, but it would also, one of the pieces will be really important that it support the covenant as well. We need to have, if there is a covenant on the land it has to be monitored on an annual basis and in this case the monitoring would involve hiring a, a professional forester to help with that. So it, it will be important that there's resource to maintain the covenant which is... Uh, that it continue producing. That, that the covenant is sustained as well as the, the, the forestry activities. So um, because annual monitoring will cost considerable I would think in the range of at least five to ten thousand dollars a year to monitor that. So, 
it's got to be built into the the whole covenant process. I think in some way to ensure that that more proactive uh, covenant will will actually have the financial backing to sustain it. So just going back to something you said earlier, you mentioned that there was more wood there today or timber than when Merv started. Absolutely. How does that work? Well, he, he had the land cruised in 1945, and then he did his first cut, which was quite a substantial cut. He was working on the pre premise of culling the, the, the disease and, and mal yeah. malformed trees off the property. So I think it was in the range of almost a one-third of the volume. Um, but then he waited a, a, a considerable amount of time to do the next cut. And then about every four or five years, f he was doing cuts. But then towards the end, he, he changed the schedule and made smaller cuts on a more of an annual basis when he was working with Mark and doing the um, milling right on site. Because Mark is, is, ha, is a, a miller as well as a, a forester, so he, he would combine the two. So if you selectively log, it gives the other trees the opportunity to grow? And yeah, and, and what Merv was always doing was looking for uh, the trees that were stressed, and he would take those out and leave the stronger ones, which is kind of the opposite of what a lot of so-called selective loggers do. They'll usually, a lot of people that, that talk the selective logging game, they usually select what they can sell and leave what they can't. Uh, Merv went uh, 180 degrees opposite to that and you know, went from the standpoint of culling out the, the, the worst trees. So he developed a very strong, healthy forest over the course of his 60 plus years that he managed that property. Hmm. I know in looking, in looking this up, one of the articles that uh, I happened to come across about his technique was the fact that he tried to leave like the tallest trees, because if you take down the tall trees, then the canopy changes and you have wind problems that then start. Yeah, and, and very often the tallest trees would represent your, your, your best genetic stock and, and that, that was how he viewed them as, as his best trees and he wanted to maintain those as seed trees. And trees that were lesser would be the ones that he would select for logging. He was also always trying to manage the canopy so that enough light would get to the, the, the floor so that the seedlings could, could uh, make their way you know, into, into a, a strong beginning as well. Okay. So this whole idea of protection, I understand, because there was, there was something on the internet that I saw, and it talked about the sale or the pending sale having to go back to the court for approval. Yes. So it's not necessarily a done deal. No, I, I don't think so. Um, but you know, once the court, the courts are the is the organization that is is uh, in essence triggering this sale. It's it is a court ordered sale. Um, so when they've found a, a suitable buyer who will follow Merv's wishes, um, and and I think either of the two would have have done that. Um, particularly with the covenant in place, I don't think it would have been um, all that pertinent who was the ultimate purchaser yeah. because that's the power of the covenant is it, it gives the level of protection that, that Merv's wishes would be, would be followed. So would that mean like Nanaimo Area Land Trust, would you be sort of monitoring the situation? Well, we, from the beginning, as the local land trust have offered our services to, to co co-monitor um, the covenant. So the, the way it would work is that um, the, the, the owner agrees to the covenant and the terms of the covenant, and then two land trusts would uh, monitor that. There would be a lead uh, organization that would take the more active role, and then there would be a, a, another organization in backup in case the, the first organization went more bund or, you know. Oh, okay fizzled out. Yeah. So this, the property Wildwood, for anybody that doesn't know, is located in Cedar, yeah, off it, Yellow Point. It's, it's on, on, I guess you'd say, the southern arm of uh, Quinnell Lake. And so it has some uh, 
some waterfront on, on Quenelle Lake. And it, it also has Merv's house and a small orchard, but uh, the majority of the property is very mature, um, very mature uh, dry Douglas fir, uh, coastal Douglas fir as the predominant species there, although it's very diverse both in species and age profile. That was one of the things that Merv was really a, a real hallmark of his approach to forestry is that you, you, you really don't want to see a, a single age stand which you get from the plantation forest. Oh, I see. So you want di species diversity. Species diversity and age diversity. And, and, and the more biodiversity that you have, the, the, the stronger, the, the, the more resilient that forest is to, to disease and um, things like fire don't affect it quite as, as much as a single age stand. So he, he was a great believer in, in uh, a real um, diverse age profile from, from ancient old growth trees to, to little seedlings mm. is what he was looking for and everything in between. So that's sort of the opposite of uh, clear cutting and then you've got the problems with runoff and... Well, and then you end up with a, a, a kind of, well, some have called it a monoculture. I wouldn't, I wouldn't use that term, but it ends up being a single age stand. And, and very often um, a lot of uh, re re repetition on the species as well. So, so what Merv uh, managed towards was diversity, I think would be the, the real, and, and he spoke on and on about, about the soil was the real resource here and, and that that was, the most crucial thing to manage the forest in such a way that the soil would continue to, to be healthy and sustain, sustain the forest. So if I've got a piece of property and I want it left, say, as parkland or for something, what could I do? What sort of steps would I take to try and do something about that? Well, you know, there's, there's a variety of things, but a lot of people aren't aware of the, the, the most powerful tool that we have is the covenanting tool. So we went through a process with, uh, with Mount Benson. That part was an agreement. That we, we had an agreement when we, when we handed the uh, property over to, to the um, regional district, we had an agreement that we would put covenant on that as well as it being parkland. So, um, so it took 10 years, but finally we, we have now uh, a covenant signed and, and at land titles on the Mount Benson Park. So it's, it's really important even with regard to park to have covenant as, a, as another layer of protection because it in a lot of ways just ensures the, the the purpose for which it was set aside will be maintained in, perp in perpetuity. So is that on the east side of Mount Benson or the it's, west side, it's, back side? It's, it's mainly on, on, on the side facing Nanaimo, so I guess you would say oh, okay. the, the, the east side. Um, it's uh, kind of the top third of, of Mount Benson, about 525 acres. But wow. just very recently, we completed the covenant, and we're very excited about that. Okay. We feel it gives it another layer of protection so that in over long periods of time, if there's changes in priorities, or changes in approach to things that the basic purpose for which it was set aside as park will, will be maintained. So, so it's really just a matter of starting a process and um, like you have to do a means test to make sure that whatever I might be giving you doesn't, it isn't environmentally a disaster or well, whatever. With, with the covenant, you don't actually have to give it to us. Um, although, you know, if, if you wanted to set park aside, that's one of the processes you could go towards was having it set as park. But with the covenant, you can, you can sell the land after it's been covenanted and, and the, the next owner has to adhere to the terms of that covenant, as does the one after that and the one after that. It, it follows the land through time and it's on title. It's registered on title for, for perpetuity. So I could do that even before I considered selling it? Absolutely, yeah. And we have a number of folks who are who are looking at doing that. It's it's a fairly involved process. Um, 
you know, the Mount Benson Covenant took uh, 10 years to, to finalize. Um, the, that, that's, I think, the longest we've worked on. Um, but I think a minimum, if everyone is in, in, you know, if it's a fairly straightforward kind of thing, would be a, a, at least six months to, to go through the, the process of setting up a, a, a proper covenant under Section 219. And then it's simply a matter of um, like going through the process. Yeah, and then and then the organizations that have signed on as the covenantors would would monitor it on an annual basis or more often if need be. And just and there's a lot of language within the covenant to ensure that uh, the there's strong legal sort of teeth to back up the terms. So that if if one of the things that that is not supposed to happen in the covenant is logging. Uh, if someone does do some logging, then they would immediately be um, in, a, in a position to have to pay 110% of the proceeds from whatever they took would, would be forfeit and go to the, the covenant holder for... Um, so it, it takes a lot of the incentive for doing that kind of thing or breaking the covenant away. So it sounds like it's a good process for somebody that uh, has a legacy, wants to pass on a legacy, maybe is another old retired logger or something else. Yeah, but what we find is there's a lot of people that over time develop a really deep love for the, the land that they own. And they feel very, very strongly that they want to see the, the, the values that they've fallen in love with protected. And so they recognize that as they age and, and pass the land on to the next owner or the owner after that, that, that those values that they, that they hold so dear could be at risk. So um, a lot of people are really coming to, to recognize that covenants have a lot of potential to allow them to protect, but also to sell. Now, obviously, it would affect the price somewhat, but um, they would know that whoever bought the land had the same values. Okay, I want to thank you, Dean, for coming here tonight. For those of viewers out there, next week, uh, Liz Hines will be talking with uh, Eleanor Florence about pubs, or is it publishing? I think it's about publishing, because she's a, a local art, uh, author. Anyway, thank you, Dean. Thank you for having me. Thank you.